I'm Dave Langer. Um, I'm the chairman of neurosurgery at Lenox Hill Hospital, uh, part of the Northwell Health System. I've been here since 2013. Uh, you may remember me from Lenox Hills, uh, from Netflix Lenox Hill, uh, in which I participated as a neurosurgeon. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you today about how invisible forces can shape your career. You know, basically what I realized very early on in my life is that doing the right thing is what matters, no matter what. That there are many influences we have on ourselves from very early on that incentivize selfishness and maybe even incentivize cheating or doing things that aren't ethical to get ahead. But what I realized very early on is that what's most important in the end is doing the right thing. That you may not be as successful as quickly, but in the end, you can live with yourself and live with the people around you, and people respect you for that. And while it may slow your ascent down, your upside is much higher. So how do invisible forces affect us? Well, I was reading an article this, just this past week in the New York Times about the fact that there are going to be approximately 300,000 births this year in the United States due to COVID. And that doesn't even include Canada. But when you start thinking about that, why is that? Well, I actually thought there might be more births this year because people are spending so much time at home. It turns out that during pandemics, even during the 1918 pandemic, the same exact thing happened. That's pro primarily because it's economic. When people are losing money, when they're under stress, they tend to have fewer children. And in fact, what was more interesting than that was there was a paragraph in this, in this op-ed piece about how not only were these relationships that already existed, people were going to have less children, but just the very fact there was a pandemic, there are less collisions. There are less people meeting for the first time. Less of these relationships that form from nothing. And it got me thinking about myself and the invisible forces, not only that led to my career success, but to just the fact that I existed on this earth. Because there are actually souls out there that will never exist because of COVID, that never happened because two people never met. And you have to realize that ultimately, that's why we're all here, that our very existence is somewhat chaotic and lucky. Well, how did I get lucky? And how do you make the most out of your luck? The answer is that as you progress through your career, the relationships matter. It's so important. Your career is starting right now. That what the people you meet, your professors, your colleagues, whoever you're, you're, whoever's training you, be kind. Honesty pays off. Work hard. Observe the people and the process. The other issue is we have a tendency to always look at what other people are doing and use that as somehow a motivation, that if you see what someone else is doing, that can somehow help you. I, dis I tend to disagree. You know, I was a rower in college, and in, in, in rowing, you're rowing with your back to the finish line. You're pulling as hard as you can. The truth is, during a race, the last thing you want to do is look out of the boat at your competition. Because if you're looking out of the boat, what are you not doing? You're not paying attention to your work. And you can only slow yourself down. That, that actually holds for what we do every day. That as long as you work as hard as you can and do things to make you successful, that's all you can do to guarantee your future success. And there's no reason to look out of the boat. You know, when I look, think back to, back to medical school and back to my early time as a neurosurgery resident, I met a woman named Kate Carrico. And Kate was a, the most in, intense brilliant scientist I'd ever met. And I just was astounded by how brilliant she was. And she taught me so many different things. Well, at that time, she was working on mRNA as a drug. And I really got into this and was helping to develop some of the early science of how we can get an RNA molecule into a cell. It's challenging. And I, Kate and I worked together on some of the early science of how to do this. And in fact, made some of the early contributions together to how to get RNA to work as a drug. Well, Fast forward, Kate probably will win the Nobel Prize this year. She and her partner, Drew Weissman, made a, a seminal discovery around 2003 to 2005 of how to stabilize RNA, and it's led directly, directly to the RNA vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna. And I got exposed to that. And what Kate taught me was the importance of an appropriate control, the importance of really accepting your data for what they are and not hallucinating that to make your idea make sense. It goes back to doing the right thing. It's a, it's a component of doing good science. And because she's such an incredible scientist, she saved the world. 
And I was a, just a small part of that. The next way I think about it is over the years, I've met some wonderful neurosurgeons as after my residency. Two of the guys were actually in Buffalo, and they were the leaders of catheter-based treatment of vascular disease. Well, about 10 years after my residency finished, I realized that all this catheter-based technology was really the future. I was a, a, an excellent open vascular neurosurgeon, but needed to learn the new techniques in order to stay up to speed on what was going on in my business. And I reached out to them in, in Buffalo, and I asked if I could train with them. And lo and behold, because of the relationship I had with them, they let me come up there three days a week for almost a year and a half. And I would leave New York City early in the morning on Wednesday or late Tuesday night, fly across Long Island up to Buffalo, arrive in, in, in sometimes in the bitter cold, and go to work for three days. And then I would come back on the weekends and work on the weekends. And I did this just so I could get trained. Ultimately, the, one of the fellows I met there, when we both finished, he asked me if I wanted to get involved in this really neat project about a thing called a video exoscope. And I just bit line and sinker. And I went to Japan with him and helped him define a new way of doing surgery. And lo and behold, that led to this exposure and this amazing field of exoscopic neurosurgery that there was actually an article about this in the New York Times about what we were doing. And more importantly, it led me uh, to Lenox Hill. And I'll get into that in a second. You know, along the way, during, during all this time, I got really involved in other types of technology. And those technologies included the idea of bringing the social media aspects of my life and my children's life to the bedside when we treat patients at the point of care. And in fact, back in 2007, my early partner and I, Ken Court, visited Apple Computer in Infinite Loop at their original headquarters and started normalizing this idea with people on Apple Healthcare. Well, fast forward to just this past few years, I went back to Apple. I visited their new, amazing new uh, office with my two partners in Playback Health, which has become the, probably, I think, the most, could become the most impactful mobile app in healthcare. That we're, what we're doing is we're creating an app that can de deliver videos, audios, text, right to a patient's cell phone, and it, in, it, we think it could extraordinarily impact communication and the patient experience uh, because of all this, these relationships that I developed over the years. You know, the last relationship that mattered to me was a guy named Erez Nosek. Erez is a fighter pilot and in, in, in the Israeli Air Force, and I, he became a neurosurgeon. And I trained him. I taught him how to do these complicated bypass surgeries. And Erez and I went to Israel together to do some of these and met his fighter pilot buddies and I gave one of them a Lennox neurosurgery hat. Well, he went up in his fighter jet and sent me a picture of that hat. But more importantly, Erez had been in the precursor of Lennox Hill, the show, in Israel. There was a show called Ichilav in Israel that was an that was immediate hit. And the Israeli filmmakers came to the U.S. and they wanted to do the same show in the U.S. And Erez said, why don't you talk to Langer? And he wouldn't have done that if I hadn't been an honest broker with him hadn't been always trying to help him get be successful. And I always live by the, the idea of following your North Star. That, you know, we're, 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 we're given many opportunities in life that are often selfish. Our SAT scores, our ACT scores, our grades, our, how we, the committees we're on, the opportunities we get. And these are often very personal and they're about me, me, me. In fact, in surgery, it's very selfish. I got to train to be the best. Well, a North Star concept is when we focus on our ideas and we surround, our, surround people around us to help us build those concepts and build those ideas. Well, Eras was one of them, and that's the North Star idea. Because you can be a gold star leader and get the gold star stuff done. But in healthcare especially, while you may need some gold star stuff, it's always important to have a North Star. Because the core principles of success and leadership are having that North Star concept. Be fearless. Embrace your competition. Surround yourself with terrific, talented people, perhaps people that are more talented than you are, and take some risk. Accept failure. Focus on long-term goals, because ultimately your ego is the enemy. You know, my, my partners are my, some of my closest friends and have had a big contribution to my life and my success. I could never have done it without them. And certainly, I, I always additionally talk about the idea of always going for your future and looking at the rainbows in life and following rainbows and chasing rainbows. Unfortunately, there will be bumps in the road and there will be things that happen to you 
that are unfortunate. But you have to bounce back, and you get up to get up off your back and and start over. You know, then the final thing that ultimately this entire thing led to was my own relationship with my own family. I was actually the the New York Times followed me around just because to see what I do on Sundays. And while that was a lot of that was great for your ego, ultimately it led me back to what was the most important relationship in your wife is your significant with your life is your significant other. That is the invisible force that ultimately leads the next generation, because that's the collision that led to my children. So my these invisible forces affect us. They infect our our ability to make decisions. They affect the relationships we have. They affect our careers, and they affect our families. And I couldn't be more grateful to speak to you about this today, and maybe contribute to some of your invisible forces. Thank you.